So what was the most common cup used by federal troops and which one was more useful on campaign? This week on the 11th OVC, cups or muckets and how to cook with them. The typical cup used by federal soldiers was made of tin-plated, thin sheet iron. There were many varieties of these items, including some interesting regional variations. So the most common cups seen in collections today, or museums, or even those that actually were used by troops, abide by the following quartermaster specifications. Tin cups were to be made of IC tin to hold one quart and be well and strongly made, with neck handle which should project 2 and 1 8 inch firmly soldered and riveted at both ends with two iron rivets each. The heads of the rivets to be covered with tin solder, the top rim of the cup, and the edges of the handle be wired with number 13 wire. The diameter of the cup to be four inches, and the depth not less than three quarter inches. Length of the handle, seven inches. Width at the upper end of the handle, one inch. At the lower end, three quarters of an inch. And so fasten on the cup as to allow of convenient handling of the same. So with those specifications being the uh, standard issue or contracted tin cup, let's go ahead and actually introduce the proverbial mucket. Uh, the reason I'm using air quotes is although it is common in reenacting, there is not much evidence of a vessel called a mucket per se. It is believed that it's a modern settler name for a bucket with a handle, a bale, and a lid, and same goes for a vessel called the corn boiler. So I'm not saying that there weren't mugs with bales or boilers with lids. There are several examples with the hinged lids and baling wires, but only a few with actual handles. Still other original small boilers with lids and bales, but I don't think they were as common as the standard Settler Row 28-ish ounce uh, empty food can with a bale added in the field. Additionally, we must consider what would have been normal or average, or my favorite term, of course, nug, carried by the rank and file. And since the tin cup specified by the quartermaster's manual that we previously talked about was contracted out, in many cases, that would have likely been the best selection, here being the cup versus the proverbial mucket. Or is it? The following is a passage from a federal soldier in Yorktown, Virginia, on April 12, 1862. He states, Dear Cousin L, I scalded one of my feet yesterday and was not able to go with the company which went out this morning to work on a road. I was sitting by the fire with several others making coffee. Each of us has a small tin kettle holding three pints or so, fitted with a tight cover. We call them muckets for want of a better name. By the way, I believe almost any of us would throw away a blanket before he would his mucket. They are so indispensable. The cover of one was crowded down so tight that there was no room for steam to escape. It swallowed the indignity with commendable patience for a time, but finally it lost all self-control and exploded, throwing hot coffee in all directions, but particularly in the direction of my left foot. It was not very badly scalded, and I hope will be well in a few days. Oliver Wilcox Norton, 83rd Pennsylvania Infantry. So obviously in that letter, he used the word mucket. Uh, so those of you who actually say there's no necessarily a period proof that the that word mucket was used, there is a little bit. Now the reason I say a little bit, even though that's obvious proof, is because that letter was written or published after the war. I personally couldn't find any other use of the word during the war, but on the other hand, if you take a look at the motivation, it doesn't seem like anything the author of that letter would bother inventing after the war. Additionally, in Francis Lord's Civil War Collector's Encyclopedia on page 168, there's a picture of a coffee boiler used by Daniel Hayden of Company E of the 149th New York Infantry, with a handle, bale, and hinged top in the, in the configuration that, of course, we call today a mucket. He doesn't necessarily use that term in the publication, however, and so when you're talking about what was used, what was accurate, what, it, what is not accurate, uh, like anything else in history, there is variation and nuance to everything. Uh, yes, was the cup actually uh, maybe more nug, more normal, more usual, more general? Uh, it was the contracted out uh, item and given to all the troopers, you know, theoretically. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily stamp out the use of the mucket. But like I said, a lot of these muckets you see in reenactors or living historians, and a lot of them use it because in a lot of different applications, they are a little bit more uh, practical, depending on the, on the context, uh, versus the cup. And I actually disagree with that. I'll show you why here in a little bit or maybe in a different video. But either way, you shouldn't just completely throw out the 
the use of the mucket or even the term mucket. However, no matter what you think, whether muckets were common or not or, or whatever, uh, it obviously wasn't an official term. So for the rest of this video, we're gonna call everything cups, even ones with handles, wires, and lids to cover them. So again, this common cup measuring about four inches tall, four and a quarter inches di in diameter, and it was a standard issue cup throughout the war. With its handle hooked to its rim with iron wires, it is called a type one cup using common, but not period terminology. This example here is a type two constructed like that of type one, again, only shorter. This example here is considered a type three. Now again, keep in mind that these, these types that I'm talking about, one, two, or three, are more collector terminology, collector's variations. Uh, they are not period terms. So again, please keep that in mind. So it's important to know that the main difference in a civilian cup versus a military cup is the means of attaching the handle to the actual cup. The handles on many civilian cups were attached with solder only. And of course, those who have actually used cups in the field on campaign know that solder only, especially on an empty cup, does not bode well. So this arrangement is fine on the farm where the cup was used for dipping water out of the spring or sampling milk from the pail. Soldiers, however, needed to put theirs in campfires, like I said before, and solder handle joints will completely fall, fall apart if the liquid level in the cup falls below them when they're heated in that fire. The solder would just come, you know, come apart. And that is why on military cups, the handles are connected with rivets at the bottom and either wires or again rivets at the top. So these cups share actually a few other common characteristics. First, they have a flat bottom with a simple turned lip. The crimping machines used to make the bottom joints without solder, however, were not used until after the war. Additionally, although cups have been documented with a variety of handle styles, the ear shape shown of the handle in this photo was the more predominant one used in the Civil War. And again, the handles that you see a lot of with the stamped U.S. were not from the Civil War. That U.S. stamp was more predominant and it was considered the Model 1874 significantly later than what was used in the Civil War. There were also some other regional variations, and since mess furniture was procured locally, this of course was reasonable. The cup shown in this example is a variation of the Type 1 cup, called by some collectors as the New York cup, and this is since the models often came with that provenance. Bigger than the typical 4x4 measurements, this one measured 4.3 inches in diameter with 4 and a quarter, sorry, 4 and 3 quarters inches tall. They were also made of thinner material than your typical cup. One cup not seen in the hands of too many living historians was the one manufactured by GI Mix, of course flatware fame if you study period uh, consumer goods uh, of that time frame. This maker was located in Connecticut and many of his products found their way into of course New England units in the Civil War. These so-called Mix cups would have been almost indestructible because of how they were designed, however their only significant disadvantage is their, you know, relatively or actually distinctly small size, which was only about 4.2 inches diameter and again, 2.5 inches tall. Again, half the height of the normal tin cup. Some other kinds of cups that were probably carried in, in small numbers, again, are ones similar to what we previously talked about the mucket. One of these is a version equipped with a lid and a bale, probably intended to be a cup equivalent of the combination utensil set combination for fork and knife and spoon, combining the qualities of a cup, pail, and covered pot. However, specimens of these, like we talked about with the mucket, with wartime provenance are relatively uncommon. Therefore, we must assume that, again, variations with the top, the handle, and the wire would have been uncommon with the troops as well. So with all that being said, the question is of using a cup versus a mucket, the first question we gotta ask is, what would be right? Again, the idea of what would I have used is, you know, you can take that into variation as well because obviously the individual soldiers made their own individual choices. But again, talking about what was normal, what was usual, and of course what was general, would generally be the standard issue cup that we talk about here. Can you use a mucket on campaign? Can you use a mucket in the field or on garrison or anything like that? Of course, the answer is yes, but like anything else, when it comes to living history or when it comes to interpreting history, you have to make sure that you know where you're talking about in the context of things. Obviously, what person, what place, what time, and what unit. With that being said, I hope this episode was useful to you. We'll go I have another episode here relatively soon regarding cooking with the muckets and my personal uh, anecdotal, if you will, experience with why I started with a cup, went to a mucket, and went back to a cup. 
Thanks again for watching the 11th OVC. Please like us on Facebook. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. And as always, until we see you in the field, ride hard.